I want to talk in this video about David Hume's ethical thinking. Hume here is not only developing a line of thinking about ethics that has been very influential and very important in its own right, but also really defines a problem, a problem that philosophers now call the problem of normativity, that I take to be fundamental. It's a fundamental problem not only in philosophy, but in our culture. I teach an entire course called Ideas of the 20th Century, which takes this as its starting point, and I see the 20th century as driven maybe more than any other single issue by the problem of normativity, not only in philosophy, but in art, in literature, in music, and in politics. It's something that it seems to me our culture is still grappling with and our civilization has not yet solved. So we need to understand what this problem is supposed to be. More important than Hume's ultimate ethical theory, I think, is actually his definition of the problem and his phrasing it in terms that have made it something that ever since the Enlightenment has been an absolutely central intellectual problem. Not only a central problem in ethics, but a problem in every intellectual field. Well, what is that problem? What's the issue? Before I get to his version of it, I want to think more generally about a kind of problem we face in making decisions. I've sketched out here for another video a general problem of, well, practical action that we might face. And here I am. I survey my options for my decision. I think about the various goals I have and the motives those give me. And then I have to make a decision. Well, that decision is going to issue in an intention to act in a certain way. If all goes well, I will act in that way. Then that action will have certain consequences. Of course, I'm framing this decision in a certain kind of setting, in a certain kind of context in the world, given my character and my own character traits, my virtues and vices, the things I know, the things I don't know. I do it in a framework that includes institutions, that includes an entire civilization that I'm part of. I end up ranking those options from better to worse, perhaps. But whatever I do, I'm doing that and making a judgment of evaluation. However, what am I doing when I describe these various options? I am describing them. And yet, what I want to come out of this is a prescription. I should do this. I am coming up with something that is an evaluation. This is better. This is worse on the basis of a description of the various possible actions open to me. And so I'm somehow going from a pure description of the world to something that is an evaluation of the world. Philosophers have talked about the distinction between description and prescription, between description and evaluation, roughly speaking, between is and ought. And the question is really how you could possibly get from one to the other. How can you make room in a world that we think is fully described, for example, by science, but even if you don't think necessarily by science, by science, by history, by our common sense experience of the world, by whatever it is, right? We describe what the world is like, but then we try to draw conclusions for action about what we ought to do, about what the world ought to be like, about what consequence would be better than what other possible consequence. We're making evaluations. We're going to ought or right or wrong or better or worse. How on earth can we get there if all we have is description? That's the problem of normativity. Normativity because we're dealing with norms. Norms for action, norms for character, norms of all sorts of kinds where we're saying this is right, this is wrong. This is correct, this is incorrect. You ought to do this, you shouldn't do that. This is permissible, this is not permissible. This is better than that. All of those are making evaluative judgments stemming from or relating to some kind of norm, some kind of standard for evaluating things, for making such judgments. But where do those norms, those standards of evaluation come from? If all we've got in descriptions of the world, on whatever basis, are pure descriptions. It looks like we're describing the world, then we evaluate it. Where's that evaluation coming from? It doesn't look like it's coming from anything in our description of the world. Well, that, in a nutshell, is not just the problem of normativity, it is the problem that Hume is pointing out. It is the key to what we're going to look at. Hume tells us that morality is not 
a matter of reason. And here's his argument in a nutshell. Morals, he says, have an influence on actions and affections. Morals are the kind of thing that does evaluate things as better or worse, that tells me to do or not do something, that draws me toward something or that pushes me away from something. Okay, so morality is supposed to have an influence on my actions. The whole reason I'm interested in evaluating when I'm deliberating is that I want it to affect my action. I'm thinking, what should I do? And so I evaluate certain options as better or worse options. I choose one. The whole point of going through that exercise and doing the evaluation is to affect my action. It also affects my feelings, my affections, as he puts it. If I think this is better, I'm going to prefer that one. I'm not going to like this one as well. I'm going to think, yes, I approve of that action. I don't approve of this one. That's going to get me into trouble. And so it is something that is done as, well, its main point, you might say. It's not incidental to morality and to thinking about norms that it has an influence on actions and affections. That's the whole point of it. They're norms for action or norms for feeling or norms for thinking or norms for speaking. But the whole point is to govern action and to have some effect on what we do. Well, he says, reason alone can have no such influence. Reason can just take me from descriptions of the world to more descriptions of the world. It can't draw me toward anything. It can't push me away from anything. It can't give me a reason to act. It can't affect my feelings. It's just a description. And so he says, morality is not a conclusion of reason. Reason cannot affect my actions, can't affect my affections. But morality does. Norms do. So morality cannot be a matter of reason. It consists of no matter of fact. If it were a matter of fact that this is wrong, for example, or that this is better than this, I could do some research and discover that fact. But in fact, <laughs> when I take out my options, describe them, and then try to choose and decide what's better than what, I'm not merely describing anymore. I'm not finding some additional matter of fact. Instead, what I'm doing is making an evaluation that is not ultimately based on reason. Here is how Hume puts it, very famously and most dramatically. In every system of morality I've met with, I've noticed that the author proceeds for some time, reasoning in the ordinary way to establish the existence of a god or making points about human affairs, and then he suddenly surprises me by moving from propositions with the usual copula is or is not to ones that are connected by ought or ought not. This seems like a very small change, but it's highly important, for as this ought or ought not expresses some new relation or affirmation, it needs to be pointed out and explained, and a reason should be given for how this new relation can be inconceivably a deduction from others that are entirely different from it. From merely is, I can never get to ought. Okay, so he says moral, well, reasoning, quote unquote, what people call moral reasoning, seems to go from is and is not to ought and ought not. It goes from this is this and that's that to this is better than this. Where is it getting that? How could we possibly go from is to ought? How could we go from is not to ought not? How could we go from this is this and that is that to this is better than that? Reason doesn't do that. Reason supplies no connection. So he's saying, look, we can describe the world and do that in rational terms. Good. Good thing that we do that. Important to understand matters of fact. We can relate ideas. That's important too. That's the other main way in which we obtain knowledge. We relate ideas. We gain knowledge of matters of fact through experience. But now we come up with conclusions like you ought to do this, or this is better than that, or that's virtuous, that's vicious. Where is that coming from? It's not in our description. There's no matter of fact. If somebody says, yeah, look, he, he killed that guy. That's wrong. Murder is wrong. I can't go out and say, well, I, let me go back to the crime scene. I, I found the blood stains and I found the murder weapon, but I didn't find this wrongness. Let me go do another search of the crime scene. <laughs> That's not going to help, right? It's not like there's some additional matter of fact I need to discover. It's not something else about the crime scene that's going to tell me that it's wrong. And so... Neither is it some additional matter of reasoning. He's saying, look, it's not like you can take the existing facts and say, well, all right, let me analyze those more carefully and try to see what rational and deductive conclusions I can get out of those matters of fact. You're never going to get to the is or is not. You're never going to get to the murder is wrong or this murder is wrong from any of that. 
And so it's not a question of an additional matter of fact or some new deduction from some set of matters of fact. That's not what's going on. Something of a very different kind is happening. When I invoke norms and move to an is or is not, ought, ought not, when I move from, sorry, an is or is not to an ought or ought not, a this is better than that, a this is virtuous, this is vicious, and so on. Here, in short, is Hume's problem. Once again, I appeal to the underpants gnomes. I've got a description. This is this way. The world is like this. Okay? It's all in terms of is. I've described things. And now, phase two. Ooh, hocus pocus. <laughs> and now phase three. Something in, that involves norms. Now I get normativity. Ought, ought not, good, bad, evil, better than that, worse than that. Where did any of that come from? How could I possibly go from those descriptions to an evaluation? How could I go from those descriptions to a prescription? There is no way to do it. It looks like it's completely mysterious. I'm going from that to profits? How do I do that? <laughs> Where's phase two? That, in effect, is Hume's problem. I don't see how it's possible for anyone to go from is to ought. So what on earth is going on here? Whatever it is, I'm pretty sure it's not a matter of reason. Well, Hume says, let's take a couple of cases. We think that cruelty is wrong. We think that generosity is good. But why? Why is cruelty wrong? Why is generosity good? There's no fact of the matter to be found in them, he says. It's not as if you take a case of cruelty and you say, OK, I see what happened here. Um, in this, there are two, let's take two really similar cases. In both of these cases, there are two children playing in the park. And the first child pushes the second one into the pond. And you think, well, OK, huh, I described this. Child A pushes child B into the pond. Looks like same description in both cases. But now in the first case, here's what was going on. It was a case of cruelty. That child was just saying, oh, man, look at this. <laughs> Beautiful pond, isn't it? And the other one says, yeah, look at the duck swimming. That kid says, oh, you know, I, I wish I could swim out there with the ducks, but I'm really afraid of water. I'm afraid of swimming. And so that's when the other child says, you're afraid of swimming, huh? Can't swim? Afraid of the water? Boom! <laughs> that's an act of cruelty. That seems wrong. But now, here's case two. Again, description the same way. These two children are there by the pond. Child A pushes child B into the pond. But what was happening there? The one child said to the other, I feel so hot. I feel so hot and so thirsty. They said, really? Maybe we should get you some water. Think I could drink that water? No, I don't think you should drink that water. But you know, hey, let me look at you. You're, wait, you're, your skin is cold and clammy. I, I don't think you're doing well. You've got to cool down. Well, what, what, what do I do? What do I do? Get in the water. It'll cool you down. Um, I, I, I'm afraid. I don't know what's There are ducks in there. They're, they're, I'm scared of ducks. So, look, you're, look, you should get in the water right now. And the child said, I, I won't get in. Push in the water. <laughs> OK, in one case, this is an act of generosity. The child is saying, look, I, th I think you've got heat stroke. I think you really need to cool your body down. I'm pushing you in the water whether you want to go or not because I think you need to be in that water. In the other case, the child is saying, you're afraid of the water. Ha, ha, ha. And so those are really different. But the description, if we ignore that history anyway, looks like it's just the same. Now, you might say, Hume's cheating here. I gave you the history to tell you why you, one of these is a case of generosity. And you say, that's good. And the other is a case of cruelty. And you say, that's wrong. But the action itself seems the same. And Hume says, there's no matter of fact to be found in the action. Now, what did we do there? I went into the background. And I gave you some additional facts about the background. It didn't affect the actual act, which was the pushing of one child into another, or of another into a pond. But what happened, you might say, is, well, something we morally evaluate on the basis of, in this case, finding out a few additional facts, true. But even given the additional facts, what leads us from those facts to that was, for example, generous? A pushed B into the pond. I tell you, A thought B was exhibiting signs of sunstroke, heat stroke. So push. 
you say, that was generous. I mean, actually, no, that child was okay, and <laughs> this was a false panic. I mean, <laughs> you know, but still, the child was being generous in doing this, was not being cruel. But, but you know, it's like, wait, wait. I mean, yes, those additional facts get us to the conclusion that in this case it was generous and good. And in that case, it was not generous. It was cruel and bad. But exactly how is it doing that? Hume says, I don't see how reason is actually getting us there. You're just supplying more facts. You just supplied some conversation. Maybe you told me something about motives. Okay, motives. It was done from this motive or that motive. But then you're making a judgment, but that was a good motive or a bad motive. And now I, I want to know where you get that. Why is that motive bad? You did it because you thought this child had heat stroke. You did this because you thought the child was afraid of water. Um, why is one of those bad, the other good? They are. Hume says, look, I'm not questioning that. I'm not saying they are bad or good. I'm just saying, what reasoning did you use to get there? He ends up saying it wasn't reasoning at all. It's the object of feeling, not of reason. It lies in yourself, not in the object. An action or sentiment or character is virtuous, virtuous or vicious. Why? Because its view causes a pleasure or uneasiness of a particular kind. So let's go back to that case. We think, why was that act of cruelty wrong? Well, think about that case as I described it. The one child pushes the other into the pond because they thought they were afraid of water and wanted them to be terrified. That seems wrong. And why do you draw that conclusion? It's before you invoke any reasoning and you think, well, fear is not good, and the child was dead. You just think, oh, that's bad, right? And so often it's the case where something just seems bad, and before the reasoning even kicks in, you just come to the conclusion it's wrong. If I were to bring a cat in here, and I were to suddenly just slap it for no reason, you'd say, that's terrible, okay? And it's not that you have some view about animal rights and so on that you think about, well, I'm, I guess, you know, gosh, I, I don't know if cats have rights exactly, but they have, you, know, you don't have to do any of that. You just say, that's really wrong. The feeling is there first. Then you might invoke reasons after that, but it's the feeling that pushes you from is to ought. And the same thing is true when the, one child thinks the other child is in trouble and so pushes them into the pond. You think that's good. Why? Because you hear the story and you think, oh, that's nice. The child was trying to help. Even if it turned out they were wrong about this, they were trying to help. And so it's feeling that takes you from one to the other. Later, you might think about reasons and trying to help and the fact that there's a moral principle of trying to help people, though where does that come from? Does that come from reason? That's Hume's problem. But we could say, okay, yes, um, it's not a question of an additional fact of the matter. What gets me there is primarily a feeling. I have a feeling. I approve of that or disapprove of that. It makes me feel good inside or bad inside. It causes a pleasure or an uneasiness of, a very, of various kinds. So here's what takes us from is to ought. How do I get there? What is phase two? Well, it's sentiment or feeling. The phase one description, it's just a description of the world. Here are the matter of, here's the matters of fact. Here's the way the world is. Phase two, feelings. I respond in a certain way. That arouses a feeling of approbation or disapprobation, as you would say. In me, I feel approval or disapproval. It makes me feel good inside or bad inside. And so it is that sentiment within me that then leads me to say, that was good, that was generous, or that was cruel, that was wrong. You ought to do this, or you shouldn't have done that. And so in those cases, what's happening is it is feeling taking me to that conclusion. Now, there are modern psychological theories, very powerful, maybe our best modern psychological theories of moral reasoning, how people actually do it. And I find it very interesting that they agree with Hume. They say it's not that we don't actually talk about reasons, that we don't engage in moral reasoning. We do, but actually it comes second. See how quickly somebody forms a moral conclusion, and then see when they come up with a reason for it. It's quick. It's quick, so you really have to do psychological experiments to find out. But the conclusion comes first. Then the person supplies the reasons. And in some cases, the feeling comes and they draw the conclusion without any reasons at all. And psychologists have constructed elaborate test cases where they basically anticipate all the possible reasons and build the case so that they don't apply. And then they say, well, still, is it right or wrong? The person says, I, it's wrong. 
I, I know it's wrong. I can't tell you what's wrong with it, though. And they're immediate in that it's wrong reaction. <laughs> so the psychologists say, you know, it's, it's actually our moral feelings, our intuitions, our sentiments that come first. Reasons come later. And that's precisely Hume's position. He's saying it's really re feeling that takes us to the ought. Then maybe we back up and come up with some mumbo jumbo about how we got there. But the fact is, it's feeling. It's like, I, that, that made me feel bad. I, I, that was wrong. And in the end, it really is sentiment and feeling and nothing else that takes us there. So let's go back to what he said. When I call something virtuous or vicious, right or wrong, good or bad, you know, admirable or evil, it's because I am constituted in such a way that I have a feeling. I have a response to it emotionally. That's what's really underlying that. And when I talk about it as wrong, I really just mean, in the end, it makes me feel bad. It gives me an unpleasant feeling. <laughs> uh, and that's really all that's going on. So here's his conclusion. A shocking conclusion, actually, for someone writing at the height of the Scottish Enlightenment in the Age of Reason. He says, reason is and ought to be the slave of the passions. Well, it is shocking. Wait, this is the height of the Age of Reason? That it ought to be the slave of the passions? But Hume says, really, that is what reason does. It follows the passions. It doesn't lead them. Now, reason is useful in describing the world. That it can do, and it can do very well. However, as we've seen in other parts of Hume's theory, actually, a lot of that, what we think of as description, is really projection onto that world. Causation, necessity, a variety of other things, even the notion of an object as a continuing thing, that's something we are imposing on the world. It's not there in the world itself. Well, guess what? Moral qualities are the same. That's good, that's bad, that's wrong, that's right. Those aren't found in the world. They're things we're projecting onto the world. And in all of those cases, the origin is an internal impression, something like the feeling of expectation in the case of causation or necessity. But in this case, the feeling of approval or disapproval, the feeling of discomfort or the feeling of pleasure we get in contemplating an action of a certain kind. So he says, there is in us something that we could fairly call a moral sense. That moral sense, that ability to have those right feelings. We feel, we respond, saying, ah, I, I sense that that's wrong. We no more have a reason for thinking that's wrong than we have a reason for thinking that's red or green or white or black or purple. We just see it. We have a sense. And he says, similarly, we have a moral sense, a capacity for these feelings that constitute the basis for our moral judgments. That moral sense gives us the right kinds of sentiments. Well, the right kind, there's no explanation. They're just part of human nature. Morality is built on those sentiments, and those sentiments taken together constitute a moral sense. So when is something right? When our moral sense approves it. When is something wrong? When our moral sense disapproves it. There's nothing else to say. There is really no reason it's a matter of sensation, or something like sensation, not of reasoning about the world.